Hey, how's it going? And today we're going to be looking at high quality render settings using the movie Render Queue. I wanted to do this because I've heard so much contradictory information, a bunch of different sources that I just decided to kind of jump into it, take it step by step myself. And this is my first attempt at collating everything. So I'll probably do a follow up to this tutorial in a couple months as I get more information, but this is my first stab at it. To get started on this, I've got just a four second clip. It's already set up, it's ready to render. And so we're gonna go into the movie render queue. It should be up here. If you don't see it and you click here, it means you gotta go put it in as a plugin. Now to get started with this whole thing, you know, the first, I like things to be first things first. So. The first thing that has to be clear in my mind is what kind of lighting are we going to be using for our indirect lighting and our reflections and i think well we're going to be using lumen shouldn't we that's the latest greatest thing so well the first thing we got to do then is make sure it's enabled so we got to come into our project settings and we got to search for global illumination and it's right there if it's not disabled if it says none you go Lumen and then it'll tell you other things need to be enabled. So just go say yes to that because there's other things that need to be hand in hand with that. Reflections is one, but just make sure that the dynamic global illumination method is Lumen and it'll tell you anything else you need to do. The other thing that you can do is if you type in hardware ray tracing, there's this one here, support for hardware ray tracing, check that. And you may have to check that before you can check this. And you also wanna check this too, is use hardware ray tracing when available. So make sure those two are enabled. That's all you have to do here. So what was kind of new to me was learning that Lumen, which is basically software ray tracing, is not mutually exclusive. So it can hand off to the GPU for hardware ray tracing, I guess when certain conditions are met. I don't know what all those conditions are, but that's under the hood, too deep under the hood for me. So, but just know that it's not just Lumen, it can hand off to the GPU. Then the last thing that I would suggest to do before you do your restart is come into edit here and go to plugins. And of course, make sure you have the movie render queue, but then also search for ProRes and make sure you've got ProRes enabled. And then you'll do your restart and then you're done with all that. So now the next thing is you're ready to render. So then we're going to jump into the movie render queue. This interface is really interesting to me because it just seems so counterintuitive that we want to go into the settings. And so we don't want to click here. We want to click here, which is, this is kind of an obscure little hyperlink there, but that's how we get to settings. So we got to click that. And then we come into settings and then we click this. And then we have kind of, this seems like a daunting array of choices, but really we don't have to worry about anything under rendering because we're already got that set up. And then we have the render format that we're going to use. So we want to use Apple ProRes because next to EXR would be the next best one with more bits. So this would be good for editing and doing further color correction, moderate color correction in maybe DaVinci Resolve or another NLE. And if not Apple ProRes, I would say PNG sequences. But if you want the highest quality, I would say do Apple ProRes. So that takes care of that. Then we got to go back. Now this yellow thing means it will be, it's enabled. We only want one thing to be rendered. So if you click that button, then we don't have to delete this. We just disable it. So, and so we're going to do what's called deferred rendering. So we're good there. So believe it or not, there's only two more settings we're going to look at, but they're deep. And one is anti-aliasing and the other is console variables. We're not going to get into color output. Game overrides would be good if you had game elements and you didn't want them rendering out you wanted to control them so but we're not gonna, we don't have any game elements in this scene so we're not going to worry about game overrides we're just going to worry about anti-aliasing and console variables so this is a deep topic and so i'll just try to make it as simple as i can if we click into it i want to just simplify this as much as i can so i have this i wrote <laughs> and basically, if you're looking at your footage and you see rough motion blur, jagged edges, or jaggies, that's like when you zoom in and you can see the pixels and stuff, then you need to increase your anti-aliasing sampling because temporal sampling will reduce that. And the more samples, it'll eventually cut the scene down into slices where it'll dither away those jaggies. You know, you won't see those anymore. This is the main idea, though. If you see any other noise or artifacts, 
then you need to deal with that in the post-process volume. You don't deal with that with this. So this just gets rid of the jaggies and anti-aliasing. Uh, aliasing, not anti-aliasing. We want anti-aliasing. But anything else, we need to deal with that in the post-process volume. So we don't use this for everything. We just use this for if we're looking at that and the motion blur looks messed up. and Or we see those, those jaggies. So anyway, let's go back in here. And then of course, there's another time, basic concept of all this is that the more samples that we're going to take, of course, the longer the rendering is going to take. So for every sample, the other rule is that we don't want to, unless we're doing path tracing and we're not, you either go spatial or temporal, but you don't do both. So what we're going to do in this particular case, the, the recommended settings, you got like low, medium, high, we talked about high would probably be 64. 16 would be on the low end if you didn't think like motion blur is going to be too much of an issue. But remember, for every single frame, it's going to render out 16 subframes or 32 subframes or 64 subframes. So it's very expensive to do the sampling. So you might just want to start with 16 and see what it looks like. If you still notice it, then go up to 32. That would be the way to go. So we're going to go 16. The default value sampling is 8 already. So if you're not going to go over 8, don't even bother doing this. You could just use the default. But we want to go up beyond. So if we're going to go over 8 samples, then kind of doing our own thing it makes no sense to use the default anti-aliasing. So we click this to override it. And we don't have to worry about any of that. We're not selecting another anti-aliasing. And then it needs time to warm up. And so we can click here. It's got 32 by default. And here for this one, it's frames. It's sampling for frames to warm up. This is sampling for frames. So if we're doing, let's say, 24 frames per second, I would say two frames. So let's do 48 frames. That would be two seconds of warm up there. Okay, and that should be good for that. And that's all we need to know about that. But remember now, we've enabled temporal sampling. If it doesn't work, we'll come back and we give 32. If that didn't work, we go to 64. So we'll accept that. Oh, I kicked myself out of there. Now the next thing is console variables. And this is a huge can of worms. I struggled and struggled and I did a video specifically about console variables because I think there's like misinformation about them. And I saw a tutorial not that long ago where someone was recommending a five for the setting and there is no five. <laughs> so I did a tutorial on how to look up what the settings actually are. It's a lot to take in initially. I turned to, if you're just looking to get started in all this, I turned to a gentleman by the name, uh, he goes by the YouTube name of the Punisher. And he has this tutorial out. It's very good. He's been doing this for 16 years. He has over a million subscribers. So I feel like he's a good place to start because obviously he has a lot of experience and time with the program. In his first comment, he pins these console variables. So, so you can copy and paste them. So that's exactly what I did. But the way my mind works is I don't like doing something without knowing what I'm doing. So I decided to look into each one of these. So what happened was I did and I revised his list. And then as I looked at his list of variables, it made a lot more sense to me. So I'm just gonna walk through this real super quick because I just don't wanna be mindlessly having you do stuff. It turns out that a lot of these are zeros and it's like, well, why are you adding things that are zero? Well, that's the setting it means to disable it. And the ones in the box here, this is actually a recommendation from Epic Games themselves, that if you're going to be using temporal sampling, it's recommended that you turn these denoisers and the accumulators off. So the vast majority of these are, is a recommendation from Unreal themselves, if and only if you're using temporal sampling, which we are. So we would want to put these variables in. Now, once you put them in, you can save them as a preset. So you only have to do this once, but the very first time through, it's kind of a pain. There's additional settings here that were recommended, but I, I, didn't use them because the default is already set to five. So for some of these, there was no point in including them because the default's already at the max setting. Some of them I bumped up, like this one, depth of field. It was recommended to be a four. I figured since we're going for high quality, why not go extremely high? So there was a five option and I did five. So you could go through and use your own judgment on adding these. And like motion blur here, a one means to do a second pass. So it just depends. 
on what you're wanting to try and experiment with. The screen percentage is interestingly for upscaling, but in this case, he's using it for downscaling. So he's rendering out 4K and he's gonna down res to 2K. And that made sense to me, so I decided to do that too. So I have it at 150, but you could, you know, experiment with these. But just don't take it blindly. Go into the console, put in the command, and then put a question mark, and it'll pop up in the output log what it is. The tedious part of all this is that you've got to go in and input every one of these, just the first line. So that part is a little bit of work. So if we come in here to settings, and I go to console variables, you would come here and you would, but what I've done, see, is I've already loaded a preset here. So I have, I counted up 13 of them that I ended up putting in. So I can go ahead by default and just enable that. Now, where did it go? Oh, here it is. So if I open this up, you can see all the ones that I added in. So those are my settings that I've decided on. You have to decide for yourself which ones you want to add, which ones you don't want to add. But don't take it blindly. Don't do it blindly because you could be doing something that, the opposite of what you're wanting to do. So don't do console variables unless you know exactly what it's doing and you know the setting for sure. So let's say you do do all that. You just come up here to load and then you can save it as a preset and you can bring it back later so you don't have to redo this all again. And then you can keep modifying them like I, that was the first one I did and then I, I did a second one. So these are definitely modifiable and you definitely wanna save a preset. You absolutely wanna save a preset because you don't wanna to have to keep doing that every time you go to render something. And believe it or not, we're getting really close to the end. So once these are all set, we're, our settings here are all set. So. That's all we have to do, except we're going to go into the last one here, which is output. And then we want to put this in a folder. So I'm going to, I have my folder on my desktop here. Let's see. My desktop here. I've got a folder all ready to go. So I'll select that folder. And I have it 1920. Here's, you can set your, your frame rate. Normally I would say do 60 frames per second because I mentioned this before. If you want to slow it down, you can in post and it should look a lot smoother and it'll just drop the frames that it doesn't need. So, but you can do 24. I'll leave it at 24 for right now. And then we're all pretty good here. And then we would just go accept. And so now we're already to go on this side of it, but we're not quite ready yet because we still have to jump into the post-process volume. And I was gonna walk through that real quickly. Okay, before we finish up here, I just wanted to show you what we could do in the post-process volume is you come up here and you search for post-process volume and it's, it's in there, so that's good to know. If there's not one, you can drag one onto the scene, but there should be one in here and we want to go to the post process volume and click on its details panel and then we'll see a whole bunch of stuff down here if we come down here there is global illumination and reflections I'm just collapsing these because these are the two that we're really the most interested in really is the global illumination and this will be enabled by default so what you can do is honestly just come in here and these are the only two I think exceptions, but for all of these, you can just drag them to the max quality. This is the a two, a four. This one I've seen defaulted in the documentation to 20,000. So you could try 20,000 and see how that helps. But everything else, you can just crank it up. And then under the ray tracing for global illumination, you can go to brute force, which is slower but more accurate, and you can jack those up to 50 and 64. And that's why you don't have to set a console variable for this, you can set it right here. So there's no need for a console variable for all that stuff. And then reflections, we're not really, it's gonna be lumen, and so there's only one quality setting for that, and you push that all the way up. And then we're not gonna get into ray trace reflections, but if you wanted to, you can just go ahead and pull them all the way up in case it comes up somehow. And then, there's a console variable that covers this. There's a 
And then the Punisher, he has a console variable for these ray trace reflection shadows, but you can set it right here. And he had it set for area. So there's no need to set those console variables because you can set them here in the post process volume. And that's it. So just push these all the way up, put these at 20,000 to start. You don't want a small value for this. And of course there's documentation online that goes over all already, but this is just, I'm giving you just a fast intro. So I don't think that these will, unless you've got a terribly complex scene, it won't bog down your system. You'll just have to see. I think the temporal sampling is what's really going to bog things down. Anything related to motion blur and usually transparencies really start bogging things down. Like for lumen reflections, there's just one, that's it too. <laughs> That's the max setting. There's one other thing I wanted to show you, and then it'll be a wrap. If we go into project settings and we search for software ray tracing, software ray tracing, which is Lumen. That is Lumen. This is the quality setting here, and they do it by distance filled voxel density because it's all based on these meshes that they these distance meshes that they use the higher this number is the, the denser the fields are and the higher quality that you get so if for some reason this is a setting you could play with by default it's at two but you could it's going to want me to restart well i'll go ahead and restart but there's also i was going to show you there's this documentation online if you just look up what is this lumen settings It'll talk about more in detail about different kinds of things that you can do. I think these are pretty much the high quality settings. So let me come back into my level sequencer here and I come back here and there's my, well, it says unsaved config, but I would load my one that I set already and it's all here and I would accept and then I would simply go render. Oh, it's, it wants to know what it wants me to render. It would be this one. Wait, is it that one? Wait, hold on. This one here. Yeah, it's a new level sequence. Yeah, so all I do now is it's all good to go. And I would just go render a new level sequence. I don't know why it's doing And then I would render, I can delete this one here, I guess. You can delete these. And then just go render local. And it's going to take a uh, it's going to take a few minutes. I don't know how long this takes. The last couple renders I've done, they only took about eight to ten minutes with those quality settings, relatively high, and the temporal samples at 16. So see, it's already like getting started. Two of 20. It looks like it's rendering pretty fast. So somehow I can tell something must have changed, but it. Somehow it bumped up my subsamples to 64 when I had it at 16, so that value must have changed somehow. But but you can imagine for every frame, 64 subsamples are being taken. I can almost guarantee you're not going to have any motion blur. But would you need to have it at 64? Uh, you know, I don't know why I put it at 64 if it doesn't need to be. So that's why the recommendation is to start on the low end and then render out. And then as you're building your presets, start with maybe just kind of like a basic bare minimum preset. And then you can use that to render out with and then see what you get. And if you're noticing problems, then go back in and start trying to target where is the problem, where is the noise, it is in the shadows, what can we do to fix that? And start hitting things more surgically versus just kicking up a global setting on the whole project when you don't necessarily need to do that. So so anyway, I hope you found this helpful. I did the best I could with trying to pull this together. And like I said, I will do a updated video in a couple months once I get my hand on doing a lot more renders. It just takes time to go in. And, and that was my other thing I was going to say is that once you have a preset saved, and you're going to go in and let's say there's something you notice in the footage that you don't like, some noise in a shadow or something or some artifacting somewhere. Just go in and change one thing. Don't change like multiple things because then you won't know what it was that you did that made it better. And then if you do have some secret sauce or something, please feel, sh <laughs> please feel free to share it in the comments. So anyway, thanks so much. Have a great day and I'll talk to you next time.